Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking today with a fellow MVP and RD, Martin. Hello. Hi, Christian. Thanks for having me. For folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? I'm currently at home, and home for me is uh, Breda, the Netherlands, which is in the south of the Netherlands. And of course, Netherlands is a small country, so even though I'm in the south, I can drive to the north in under three hours, but uh, it is near the Belgian border. I live in uh, the Netherlands. Um, I'm CTO at Rapid Circle, a Microsoft implementation partner, uh, about 400 people, uh, locations in the Netherlands, in India, in Australia, and we focus on yeah, Microsoft Cloud in, in quite a broad sense. And uh, um, I try to be the I try to be the 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 the, the, the connecting part the, uh, between the, the the products that Microsoft offer, the technology that Microsoft offers, and the solutions that customers are uh, are looking for. Mm -hmm. um, I live here with my wife, uh, two boys, dog. Um, so yeah, uh, all uh, uh, happy, one happy family. <laughs> And I know that you guys have been busy with, I don't know how many acquisitions of the history of, of Rapid Circle, but I, like I've known like uh, Daniel McPherson for years and years, you yeah. know, down from Australia. And then of course, uh, Paul Colmsey's company just got acquired as well. So picking up, you guys also acquiring MVPs. Is that part of your strategy? <laughs> no, well, not, not uh, per se, but uh, it happens uh, on the journey that we're, that we're undertaking. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah. So in the Netherlands, uh, I, I myself am from one of the acquisitions. Uh, so Rapid Circle started in 2008. Uh, I started my company uh, together with two other folks in 2010 um, called Portiva. And Portiva was acquired by Rapid Circle a year and a half ago. Um, and I kind of moved on uh, being the CTO from, from Portiva. I moved to uh, being CTO of, uh, of Rapid Circle. And uh, uh, we did some acquisitions in Australia, indeed. Uh, uh, Intec, uh, 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 which is a really uh, great partner and uh, for for uh, unified communications, and um, and we did adopt and embrace, uh, and uh, indeed seven sigma now. So yeah, um, we're we're growing, and um, uh, I think we're really focusing on 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 other on acquisitions or or merging or, or really on on organizations that really have something to add, some added value, something that we are missing that we don't have in our uh, in our stack in our offerings yet. And works well, I think, and well, it's great people to work together with. And it, well, I just I, and I mentioned that just because I hear Rapid Circle mentioned uh, a lot just in different places. Oh, so it's wow. it's good to see you guys are growing and have a bunch of familiar faces within, and and so it's always great to hear your partners that you know of that are succeeding and and growing. Yeah. So one of the big topics of this month is around community. Of course, doing these, you know, getting to know people within the community and kind of their journey. And I'll come back to that question, but. Um, you know, what's kind of the state of, of community and your involvement? What do you see happening now that we're post pandemic? Is it people starting to show up at things again? I think so. Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to, uh, to, uh, it, it was hard to sustain the community during the pandemic. And, uh, and now that we're back in, in, in person to in-person events, I think it helps, and every time we organize, I'm I'm the board member of the DWIC, which is uh, one of the larger uh, communities here in the Netherlands uh, when it comes to Microsoft 365. And I think before uh, pre-pandemic, we organized a meetup every month, um, and there were always well visited, uh, always 70, 80, sometimes 90 uh, attendees, uh, great speakers, great topics. And then the pandemic had hit us, and it, it, it didn't make sense to have a meetup every month. Um, that people would be joining online only, but we wanted to keep the community alive. So we kind of, when we did a little step back and we moved to um, a, a meetup every two months and now we're back and we are discussing or, or debating, is it, should we go back to a monthly event or should we stick to a bi-monthly event? And, and we've chosen the latter so far and we'll see if that, that works, um, but every time when people come to to one of our events, they're like, "Oh, we're so happy that we can do this again." Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we really have to uh, 
um, we we have to do more to to attract people, to get people to the events, and and to get speakers to speak at the events. Now the same with um, with uh, Collab Days uh, Netherlands, which we organized uh, uh, last year in uh, in September, and, um, and this is the successor of uh, SharePoint Saturday Netherlands, which we've been organizing for uh, nine years in a row. And then we moved to Collab Days, and and the, the first time we organized it, it was during the pandemic. So we did two online versions, and uh, this time in September, it was the first in-person event that we organized again. And we were kind of used that when we did a call for sponsors, that uh, it would be a first come, first serve basis because we would be sold out in uh, two hours. Yeah, everybody would love to be a sponsor on our event, and this time we really had to make an effort. In the end. We got the amount of sponsors we were looking for, and uh, it was a successful event, and uh, 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 all went well. But it it required a lot of more phone calling, uh, sending out reminders, etc. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's a bit harder. I think uh, people and and organizations, uh, companies, they're still a little bit reluctant. Yeah, we're we're doing kind of something similar with our user group where we're. You know, we're, we're struggling to get people back to, we've been back in person for quite some time, but um, I just, the, the, you know, the flexibility of dialing in, we have, you know, four yeah. times as many dialing in as we do that are there in person. And, you know, that's, that it's not huge here locally, but that's, that's something that you have to factor in as well. There's some people that are happy to never go back in person to events. And so and that's Absolutely. why it's a little bit extra work is to dig those, find those new people that are interested in being there in person. Yeah, I think what also doesn't help in uh, when it comes to community events, they're always uh, in evenings, they're always post office hours, yeah. uh, uh, outside office hours, um, or at least that it, it has always been uh, like that. And now I think during the pandemic, people have become more aware of, of uh, separating uh, business life and personal life uh, because the first couple of months during the pandemic, it was just intertwined so much and, and everybody was just working. And uh, and, we, and we started to realize, hey, maybe work-life balance works a little bit differently. And it was easier to separate when we still went to the office and then we got back and then uh, you get out of the car and then your personal uh, part of the day starts, your family time starts. But now suddenly you're just walking out of your home office and then personal life family time uh, should start, but it doesn't really work like that. So people were trying to find more of a balance and more of a separation. And that also means nighttime is my time and I don't want to go to a community event because even though I like it and even though I like meeting people, it's still work related and not family related. So yeah. that also, I think, um, uh, doesn't really help but that, in that that mindset that people have grown during the pandemic. Have you guys, but, discussed, is your collab days still on Saturday? Have you moved yeah. it during the week? Okay, because we moved ours to Friday and our numbers went up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something we have been uh, discussing. Uh, um, so we might look into organizing it on a, on a weekday actually uh, uh, this year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I think we just kind of came to that same conclusion that, and it, uh, you know, with I mean, one experiment, we're going to do it again this year, where we'll put it on a Friday. Um, but from the last time, it, we jumped up about fifty percent in our in our attendance. Yeah, uh, and yeah. so we're 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 hoping that the same thing works out. Well, so I know you've been an MVP for seven seven time MVP, eight time yep. something around there. Yeah, uh, seven time I think. Yeah, and and how long have you been an RD and for Microsoft Regional Director? For those that don't know. Um, I think four years, four years or five years, four years, I think. Yeah. So I always like to ask that it's like, what was your, if you can go in the way back machine, what was that process to become an MVP? Kind of what was your path into being an MVP? Yeah, it's, um, I, I think I started public with my public speaking, maybe, um, at the, the end of the zeros, I think 2007, 2008, that's when I started doing, um, uh, when I joined at the, the community that I'm now a board member of, but I, when, and that community already existed before that. And I did some speaking events, uh, uh local user groups. Um, I started speaking at back then SharePoint Saturday, uh, we had, SharePoint Connections back in the days, which was an event uh, organized in Amsterdam, a commercial event, commercially organized. Um, and I think the first 
couple of times that I that I did uh, uh, speaking events, I was like, okay, maybe this is, maybe someone will nominate me as an MVP. Maybe that will be cool. And that never happened. Yeah. Uh, I still I don't know why. Or maybe it did happen, but I just I don't know. Um, and as the years moved on, I just kept on doing my things. Uh, I became a board member. I started. Uh, speaking a little bit more uh, outside of the Netherlands, uh, etc. And suddenly, uh, I got nominated, and I got an, uh, an, an, an the, the confirmation email. Hey, Marta, congratulations! You've become an, uh, an MVP. Uh, I think when I became an MVP, it was the last time we uh, still had SharePoint MVP. So I think I was a SharePoint MVP, and then the year after that, I became an. Uh, the office, office and services and something, yeah. Server yeah. and services, I think. Yeah, yeah, it? I think yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, for me, it came quite unexpected because I have been uh, participating in uh, at least in the Dutch community for uh, for more than just a couple of years already, mm -hmm. uh, but apparently never. It's it's kind of a black box, and and yeah. Very um, that's yeah. yeah I, I I mean I don't blame anyone. It's it just it just that didn't happen, and but I was okay with it. I still did my thing, um, and uh, I was not really uh, uh, maybe the first year I was okay. Maybe I could become an MVP, but it didn't happen, and then I just let it go, and then suddenly five six years later, hey, you're an MVP. You, you know, it's interesting. I, 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 like I've talked to people. Uh, so one one good friend and you know him and RD and MVP. And I remember he was really pushing for a couple of years to become an MVP. And, and finally he just, it, it, we were having a conversation and he said, you know, I just, I, uh, I'm just putting that aside. Like, I don't care if it happens, it happens. I'm not pushing for it. I'm not trying for it. I'm just, uh, you know, all, all the benefits. I have all the benefits of, participating in, in, in the communities is I've got great work. My network is exploded. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's been fantastic. It's been beneficial by being out there. And of course the, just a personal uh, uh, gratification of helping people on that side of things. A month later, he I becomes think. an MVP. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, it, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's like the force Yoda talking to Luke, you know, just like, just let go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true. There's something yeah. to say about that. You know, there's, um, you know, a little bit of humility helps uh, in, in your pursuit of something like this, but. I agree. I, th I think you should never aim to become an MVP. I think you should aim to be a contributor to the community. If that's something you're looking for, then, uh, then, then becoming an MVP will happen automatically, or will be the ultimate reward, or or whatever. But it should not be your goal to become an MVP. That will never work. I, and I've talked to some people who have said, you know, uh, I, I'm also not able to, or not interested in giving back to the degree that they see uh, some MVPs doing. There's nothing wrong with that. Being a a participant within the community and is just something that you go and do and is part of your, uh, your persona there. And, but, but focus on family and job and, and elsewhere. I, for, for a lot of it, it, it I, and I often say, and I'm sure you say the same thing is like, look, I would do these things, whether or not I had the MVP, I still yes. would interview and talk to people. I'd still write the content. I'd still, you know, speak at the occasional conference of those things because I enjoy that. I enjoy documenting and and getting feedback on and best practices and sharing that information out there and I'll do it regardless. So eventually the program shuts down or I don't get renewed. I'm still going to do the exact same stuff. Yeah, yeah I That's agree. Pretty I completely thing. agree. Yeah. 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 And and what I really like about the community, I mean 15 years ago uh when I started in the community, I was um this is this kid I still call my myself back then and uh, and I was doing my first baby steps into the community and I was really excited to, to get on stage and, and talk to 40, 50, 60 people at a community, at a, at a local meetup um, and talking to people. And I had my heroes back in the days. Uh, and now uh, I, I still have uh, I still have much, much respect and I still look up to people. But now it's also my time to help others uh, and to give them advice and and to coach them and to uh, to offer a little bit of mentorship and to talk to them outside the, the community events. Uh, I, I have calls now and then with people within the Dutch community um, or or just a couple of WhatsApp messages or, hey, let's get uh, uh, in a Teams call and, and let's discuss 
Hey, Maarten, I have this new topic I want to talk about. Can you help me a little bit about how should I write the abstract? What what should be in the presentation? What not? I love it. Yeah, that's really that that that, and and I will always keep doing that as as long as people think that my um, that that I'm and that I'm of value that I can actually help them. Yeah, then then I will keep on doing this because this is the part of my job that I love. Yeah, you know, I remember hearing about some people presenting and be talk about you know people heckling them in their sessions and and you know causing problems. I remember that the first time I had that experience, and he's a good personal friend. You know, it was Richard Harbridge. It was yeah, before he was an MVP, so he's so a young guy. So it was in a session, and I was presenting that, and he had these questions and feedback, and he gave feedback on the presentation. Somebody came up to me afterwards, like, "Can't believe that he said that," and to you, I'm like. He was right. No, that was great <laughs> feedback. And I made changes to that deck and uh, it, it, and we're good friends now. I mean, I always appreciate that having that that community feedback. And that's why I mean, it, it, uh, that's actually a recommendation I give to people all the time is is if you want to you're trying to figure out how to get involved uh, is to ask questions and provide that feedback, because yeah. I I. I Look, I've, I've presented as you have to huge audiences. I've I've done I've keynoted huge conferences and done those things. Some of my favorite events, like I was just thinking of SharePoint Saturday Bend, Oregon, where we had I think the biggest we were was ninety eight attendees. So then we had speakers and sponsors. It wasn't a whole lot. It was a small event. I those were fantastic events because sitting with six to ten people in a session during the day. And having more of an in-depth conversation and answering their questions, I get so much more out of that than just yep. presenting to somebody. It's part of why I, I don't like you. online because people don't speak up enough. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It, and it, it happens even on uh, busy uh, uh, meetups or community events or even large uh, commercially organized uh, conferences. It just happens that you think you have a great topic. Uh, the program team of the conference thinks you have a great topic because they selected you and you're in the program. But apparently uh, there's other greater topics in that same session slot or uh, or your topic is maybe not so cool. And you have, I don't know, maybe 10, 15, 20 people in your room um, uh, or it's a very small meetup. And, 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 there, and that's the reason that you only have so many people in your room. I don't care. I don't mind. In fact, just as you just mentioned, that gives the opportunity to actually have a conversation instead of me just broadcasting and hoping that that that, that, that gets digested and the people get something out of my story. But now suddenly you have the opportunity to listen to their story as well. And they're there for a reason. So they probably have a story. All right. And so then you can learn from each other. And yeah, that's that's a great, great experience. Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I always tell people is that one of the reasons I don't really get nervous up on stage uh, was for uh, a couple of years, I was the lead singer of an alternative rock band. So in the early I 90s, didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah. So I did that for, for years and we, we, at the, towards the end there, the last six months, we were gigging almost every single weekend and sometimes both Friday and Saturday nights. And um, yeah. And my, my wife, with uh, uh, our little daughter at home, we're not fans of that era. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, we had a, a few times where there were you know a handful of people. We were at some dive bar place, staying playing on their little stage, and at some point, there's like a smoking area out back, and everybody went out. There was nobody in there. And I <laughs> turned to my guitarist and and we're like, "Hey, we're still playing for us. I just think of it like a practice again." And we're we love our music. Let's just keep going and, and doing this. And, you know, it, they were fun shows to go and do. But um, generally, if there's no one in your room, I probably would stop presenting. So it doesn't entirely carry over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no one. Yes. It's but course. one person. I mean, that's all you need. Yeah. And hey, they, they've yeah. got a little more uh, quality time with the presenter. Yeah, yeah. true. So, true. yeah, it's, that's something I do love as well. But so uh, so. Last question for you. So what what topics are you passionate about? Like you really focused on right now you know, that you're writing about or you're speaking about right now? Um, so one of the topics I've been really diving into lately is uh, sustainability. Um, we get a lot of questions uh, lately from customers that um, and I think up to, 
I don't know, maybe a year ago, um, uh, when when customers would come to us and they would ask us, could you help build a business case for us to move a workload, a certain workload to the cloud? Um, and the business case is almost always uh, uh, financially driven. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to make a, a financial, if it's just finance, if it's just um, uh, uh, cutting costs that you're interested in, then moving to the cloud is not per se the best option, right? Because it's not always cheaper to go to the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, it is if you can also make it more efficient and you should look into that, right? But anyway, that's an all other topic. But the reason yeah. why I'm saying this is because as of lately, customers are also asking us, could you add uh, sustainability into that business case as well? Because we have shareholders, we have um, a very uh, a critic uh, customer uh, set. We have uh, a, a government that is interested in what we do uh, concerning CO2 footprint, uh, carbon footprint, etc. So we need to um, have a look at our, our carbon footprint. And our IT is a large part of our carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. And so and, um, and we're talking about scope one, scope two, scope three, uh, etc. Um, and how can you how can you add that to your business case? And Microsoft has released the uh, carbon emissions dashboards in, uh, in Power BI, which let you already have a look at, uh, so what is my carbon footprint for my M365 environment? Or what is my carbon footprint for my Azure uh, environment per subscription, per uh, workload, uh, et cetera. So that really, really helps. Uh, but now they've, uh, as of uh, summer last year, they've, they've moved one step further and now they have the uh, sustainability manager as well, which is not just about your carbon footprint of your uh, of the Microsoft data center, but it's about the carbon footprint of your entire organization. Mm. So it's also about uh, cars that you have. It's about home offices. It's about the, the real, the, the, the office buildings. How much energy do they consume? It's even about um, if you deliver products and your customers use those products, how much uh, carbon do they generate in using your products? So even that's part of uh, of the carbon footprint of uh, of an organization. Um, so that's a topic that I'm really, uh, really genuinely uh, interested in. Um, I, I'm I'm I've been um, looking into sustainability for for a large part of my life. I, I did this I live in my house here. I have 48 solar panels. I mm. uh, my house is completely energy neutral. I have triple glass everywhere. I have an uh, uh, a uh, an earth uh, a geo uh, thermic uh, warmth pump in my house. Uh, I drive. I, we have two electric cars. Uh, so it's all about sustainability, and I love it that this is becoming a thing for for many organizations as well. And where I can help, yeah, I I, I try to help. So logically, because I'm working with a lot of customers in, on this topic, yeah, it helps that uh, I'm I'm building up knowledge about this myself as well. And I try to share that knowledge again within the community. Yeah, no, it's a great topic. I know hey, it's an important and it's a growing topic. Uh, there's there's a lot. If you want to talk about a sustainable topic, see what I did there. Um, yeah. It's going to be around for a long time <laughs> as more, yeah, I agree. We're focusing I agree. more and more on. And rightfully so. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Well, Martin, hey, I, I appreciate your time. It's great to finally get to catch up. We've known each other for, for many, many years. Going yes. back to, I mean, I don't know which one, but probably back to the uh, SharePoint Saturday Netherlands events. Um, yeah, I know I did yeah. a lot of those for, for years. So, But yeah. uh, great to connect with you. Thanks for being uh, my guest here on the 200th episode of oh, wow. MVP Buzz Chat. So, wow. Uh, Thanks so much. Yeah. I feel honored. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having for, me. It was great. Folks, great the, if people want to connect with you or reach out to you, what are the best ways to find you? Uh, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, Twitter, it's Martin Eccles. Uh, you can find me on, on LinkedIn as well. I think that that works the best. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot, Martin. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Chris. Bye. Wow.